We're commemorating the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Midway, uh, which most historians agree is the most significant U.S. Navy victory in American history, uh, if not in world history, some historians have argued. And while we remember those who fought and died at Midway, uh, this ceremony is dedicated to a handful of intelligence and cryptologic professionals, today's Information Dominance Corps, whose ingenuity, tireless efforts, uh, provided critical information and operational intelligence to Admiral Nimitz, thus allowing him and our fleet to turn the tide of history. Finally, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the first speaker is uh, Admiral uh, Pat Driscoll. He's our deputy commander. Uh, Admiral Driscoll is a, a naval aviator, and he's commanded at sea uh, the USS Harry Truman uh, Strike Group, Strike Group 10. And I first met him when he was the uh, carrier air wing commander, or CAG, for CAG-5 out in, at Sugi, Japan. And so I know that he fundamentally understands the role that uh, naval intelligence and cryptology, uh, or today's Information Dominance Corps, provides to uh, strike warfare uh, from the Navy. And so without uh, further ado, please uh, welcome uh, Admiral Driscoll. Good morning, everyone. Aloha. 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 Commander, put the troops at ease, please. Well, thank you, Captain Fennell, and welcome, everybody, to the Battle of Midway commemoration. I want to uh, acknowledge two special guests that we have with us, both superb intel officers. Vice Admiral Rogers, Commander of 10th Fleet and U.S. Fleet uh, Command, Cyber Command, and of course, uh, Rear Admiral Showers. Uh, Rear Admiral Showers, you're a true hero who played a key role in the victory at Midway, which we will hear about this morning. And uh, I want to welcome the Showers family uh, here. It's an honor to have you here today. Uh, and I see uh, all the flags, all the SESs, welcome. Thank you for participating on this, uh, on this special commemoration. I really want to talk a little bit, and I'll talk briefly, so, but I really want to talk a little bit about uh, what the situation was leading up uh, to the, uh, the Battle of Midway. And we, I think, sometimes really forget uh, what dire straits uh, we were in. Uh, we'll pause to reflect upon the events 70 years ago. Uh, and I think that uh, those of us living here on uh, Oahu uh, have a, will have a, you know, a good appreciation for really uh, how dire the situation was and, uh, and try to put yourself back 70 years ago and think about what it must have been like living here then. Of course, everyone knows the disastrous effects of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese Navy executed a bold precision strike that crippled our, battles, our battle fleet, uh, fleet and uh, had a devastating effect on the psyche of the American people. There had been a complete failure of tactical and operational intelligence, and we paid a heavy price for it. We were, we were caught completely off guard. What many of us are not so familiar with is what the Japanese Navy did after the attack on Pearl Harbor. They conducted a sea, air, land blitzkrieg, a precisely choreographed ballet over 6,000 nautical miles uh, front against the British, American, Dutch, Australian fleet. The Japanese sliced their way south to Australia virtually unimpeded. Down through into China, to Malaysia, then the Philippines, despite MacArthur's determined stand at Corregidor. Singapore, the British citadel in the east, crumbled to the Japanese Imperial Army. Onto Sumatra, Borneo, Java, and Timor. On they rolled, the unstoppable Japanese invasion tsunami destroying the majority of the British, Australian, and Dutch naval forces along the way. Their objective, their final objective, was the Solomon Islands just north of the Coral Sea. It was an impressive demonstration of combined maneuver warfare from the sea. Medium range Japanese bombers escorted by the superb Zero fighter destroyed airfields and aircraft on the ground to achieve air superiority locally. Then amphibious assault forces escorted by powerful battleships and destroyers quickly grabbed the ground troops, landed the ground troops that they grabbed those airfields, repaired them, and the bombers flew in and started attacking the next target nation. This impressive naval force had almost accomplished all the Imperial uh, Japan's objectives with the taking of key islands in the Solomons. This would allow the Japanese Navy to interdict lines of communication between the United States and our key ally of Australia. Admiral King directed Admiral Nimitz to hold the line at Midway, Hawaii, 
and Australia. With the meager resources at hand up to that point in early 1942, the U.S. Navy was left throwing soft jabs like the Doolittle Raid and some single carrier attack raids by Halsey. Then the order came from Nimitz for Admiral Fletcher to take carriers Yorktown and Lexington down to the Solomon Islands and stop the amphibious landing. This was based on some signals intelligence that the Japanese were planning an operation in that area. This led to the first true carrier battle. In the fight that came to be known as the Battle of Coral Sea, the performance of naval aviation was a mixed bag. Dive bomber pilots could not see the Japanese carriers as they rolled in because the screen, their windscreens fogged up as they came down in altitude. The, uh, uh, the dive bombers had the problem with the windscreens. Uh, our torpedo planes at the, at the time were antiquated, and uh, they were easy prey for the ag Agile Zero fighters. If they were brave enough and, uh, and fought through the fighter cover and actually got to the point where they could drop a torpedo, the torpedoes off often didn't explode on impact. And finally, our fighters were learning how to effectively grapple with the Japanese Zeros, but too often their 50 caliber machine guns would jam uh, when they were in firing position. Despite all these challenges, the U.S. Navy fought the Japanese invasion force to a draw, with each side losing a big deck carrier and the aircraft with them. During the battle, we lost Lexington and Yorktown sustained significant bomb damage and had to limp back to Pearl Harbor. The Japanese Admiral Yamamoto had engineered a stunningly successful drive to the south, completing nearly all objectives. He had put his Navy in a position to cut the lifeline between Australia and the United States. He next sought to tighten the noose around the U.S. Navy by capturing the island of Midway to the west-northwest of Hawaii. By doing so, he would force Nimitz into a defensive posture, requiring the U.S. carrier forces in positions close to Hawaii and the west coast to prevent attacks on the mainland. So, imagine what it must have felt like. The Japanese had sunk the surface fleet at Pearl Harbor. We were overwhelmingly forced, with overwhelming force, they swept down through the Pacific conquering all in their path. They had bested the fighting forces of Great Britain, Australia, the Dutch, and the United States. Taking Midway was a bold initiative by Yamamoto, and he was well known to be a very successful gambler. He felt he held the, the winning hand. The Japanese had six big deck carriers in Midway assault force and several smaller ones. His intelligence told him that the Americans only had two flat tops remaining. The deck was stacked in his favor. On the other hand, Nimitz had been losing at the gambling table. It would be a long shot to beat the skilled and powerful Yamamoto at Midway. And thanks to Admiral Showers and his teammates, Nimitz had the ace in the hole he needed to stop Yamamoto and the Japanese invasion force. And that ace was a cryptological work performed by Admiral Showers and his teammates, which I look forward to hearing about shortly. So to try to think about that was the, uh, the tactical situation that uh, the Pacific Fleet was in uh, as the Armada, truly a large assault force, uh, six, carry, six large deck carriers, uh, a bunch of smaller carriers, and amphibious attack craft that had been trained going from Japan all the way down to Australia in amphibious force, and this, this force was gathering off the coast of Midway, ready to make uh, the assault there. And we, we had uh, some information uh, and, and uh, locating data, but uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't firm. And I think what we'll hear today is the marvelous work and the uh, truly uh, nation-saving work that this group of, uh, of cryptologists and intel officers did for us. Uh, and before we hear from Emma Showers, though, we're going to hear from uh, Vice Admiral Mike Rogers. And once again, I want to welcome you to Pacific Fleet, sir. Uh, I'll turn the podium over to him in a second. Uh, he is the commander, as I said, of 10th Fleet and the commander of UA U.S. Fleet Cyber Command. He's an expert in both naval and cyber, cyber warfare. Uh, he is responsible for ensuring naval forces are ready to fight and win in the cyber domain and to ensure the security of our networks. There is no better officer in the Navy to speak to us today about intelligence at Midway than Mike Rogers. 